Mr. Sullivan. There's that Mr. Jackson again. Happy Easter. Every 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 time I phone this number, um, man, uh, Mr. Jackson answers the phone. Isn't that funny? And here yeah. we are. We have gathered we are. our attention. Yes, indeed. And I'm that's an important thing. Very powerful. Um, you know, it's very powerful. This whole thing about attention, and I, I think it's a skill. You know, I think it's a skill that is, if you don't really practice it, you will lose it. Yes, I have been paying particular attention to my attention in the last mm -hmm. several days, mm -hmm. just with an eye that I, I'm speculating that my attention is 100% of the time engaged in something. Mm -hmm. And it's either yeah, engaged well, in that. something that I've chosen it to be engaged in, or it's being engaged in something it has been seduced into being engaged in. Okay, so how do you start the day? Because obviously when you're sleeping, you're not, you're not actually That's exactly or engaging. Right. Engaging. So how from... Um, <clears throat> You know, the children call sleeping the, um, I think they call it dark sleep, and then naps are light sleep. So, <laughs> right, so dark after, sleep. So after you've had a dark sleep, after you've had a dark sleep, how do you get back yes. in? Um, and the, um, how, do, how do you get focused first thing in the morning? There, you know, often the first thing is my, is my phone. That's often the first glance. And that will be just to see what's happened overnight, Dan. Mm -hmm. Just to see what's happened overnight. So that uh, I do often take um, some time. This is where um, John Paul DeJoria, when we had him on I Love Marketing, we talked about mm -hmm. morning routines. And one of the things was I, and I will often do this is I will lay in bed and kind of just orient myself and, and just think often I'll carry on a thought that I've been having, um, you know, in that twilight while I'm kind of waking up that it'll, it'll you know, I'll have been thinking, um, I wake up with a thought or wake up with something and I'll just kind of explore that, um, that, idea and mm -hmm. so i often do a lot of of that because uh, i've got the time to kind of i don't wake up with an alarm or at any uh particular um time so my days unless i have them um outlined or unless i have something going on with them my days will often be as Ned Hollowell describes them as a toddler at a picnic, <laughs> wandering through with whatever gathers my attention. You know, oh, look at this. Oh, what's this? And so can I ask you a question about that? I mean, yeah. this is how you're, you're reflecting it now, but uh, has this been constant from the beginning? Like, my, my sense is that our way we come to grips with using our brain, using our mind, yes. uh, develops very, very early, and we're completely alone while we're doing it, because, uh -huh. uh, uh, you know, we were in a playpen, or we were in, uh, you know, a crib, yes. and we're starting to come to grips with the world around us, shapes, yes. colors, sounds. So, uh, how far can you trace it back that that's how you approach, um, how you get your mind uh, in gear for the day. Um, far back, can I trace the um, visualizer? Lying in you bed. Know? Yeah, lying yeah, in I've bed. I've often yeah. had, yeah, I've often, as far back as I can remember, I've known about um, visualization. And uh, you know, I think early on, I realized that I could visualize my in my imagination real things. And, you know, as an athlete, I would, 
um, I would often like play tennis matches in my, um, mm-hmm. you know, in my mind, I would be able to, mm-hmm. you know, practice moves and play, uh, go over things. And, and I had really good ability to focus my mind uh, in that way, you know, being able mm-hmm. to do that. Now, mm-hmm. of course, the main, the difference now is that back then of course there was no um no internet you know so your mind was the options for your mind to be seduced were were less i think Mm -hmm. you know so you were either um you know reading or um you know i didn't have a tv in my room um growing up or um and I don't have one in my room now, but I mean, growing up, I didn't have, have TV or um, anything like that. So I would either, you know, read or visualize or. Um, yeah. 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 Well, it's re- interesting. I, I was pondering this thought this week that it's actually remarkable the amount of different ways that humans, um, you know, come to grips with yes. their individual minds, uh-huh. uh, you know, multiplied by the number of people on the planet, because I have a feeling there's probably, um, if you really drilled down on any one person, you'd find that they kind of do it differently than anyone else. Uh-huh. Uh, and the reason is because we're putting, exper- we're putting experiences together from what we knew about yesterday. So you're, you're not starting, you know, from zero, you're starting with all sorts of images that you already have in your mind. Yes. And the thing that I find really remarkable is the degree that we can actually communicate with each other, given the fact that we each develop our brains in the own, in uh, in a different way. I, I'm making that as a thesis. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know if you agree with it or not, but uh, I bet if you took 20 people and you, you know, kind of gave them a chance to actually talk about what's their best way of getting in gear for the day mentally. Yeah. Uh, they tell, they tell you a different story. And uh, especially if they hadn't heard somebody else, they hadn't heard somebody else describe it. Uh-huh. Like, you know, I don't have a really, um, yeah, I, I've, I've noticed like even over the last couple of years, my stance on appointments and time, commitments has been uh has softened and i've been putting those things in my calendar and and it's been it's improved my um productivity like to have things i've i've un, i've understood the value of synchronous and scheduled time blocked for a particular purpose like this like our standing sunday appointment is you know it's very it's created a great um environment for us you know we've been doing this now mm-hmm. for over uh, two years i guess now right pushing pushing three now coming up on three years and so yeah. i i don't w- what i notice about it is that there's you know the great thing is there's been zero procrastination around it we are um, consistently here, we know what what's going to um, happen, and we have created a great body of work from this. You know that there's mm-hmm. a lot that we've 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 birthed some incredible um, some incredible thoughts that have been mm-hmm. very helpful for both of us um, and for others. You know, in mm-hmm. in the conversation in a way mm-hmm. that this has 100% of our attention for this mm-hmm. one hour. And mm-hmm. we, we uh, consciously made the decision to put ourselves in that situation that we would, um, mm-hmm. that we would do that. Now, if there was some way that if it were required that we had to on our own go off and produce a 30 minute, um, you know, our 30 minute thoughts on procrastination or, uh, 
productivity or anything that we've done separately from each other, that you're responsible for producing 30 minutes, I'm responsible for producing 30 minutes. I am for sure certain that there would be a lot of procrastination involved in that, that it would take four or five hours of time to produce Mm -hmm. that 30 minutes where we can both arrive here and in 60 minutes create our combined 60 minutes with no thought or um, time uh, burden before or after that. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a really interesting, you know, um, that's a really interesting thought to me because my, uh, what I've eliminated essentially from my life over the, I would say the last year, certainly over the last year is anything where I have to go off and do something on my own. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the most that I'll do on my own is, um, Maybe one of my little tools, like a fast filter, uh-huh. and uh, and I'll you know I'll put some thoughts. You know, what's the project that I want to work on? What's the best result? What's the worst result? And regarding the best result, what are five things that would lead to it? And this is this is where I'm going to be talking to someone else about an action project. And we just have a requirement in our company for any meeting. I certainly do. Mm-hmm. That somebody has to have a project, uh, and they're um, they're going to take responsibility for clarifying to everyone else when they come into the meeting what the project is, why it's such a good thing. If we don't do the project, why it's a bad thing, and what would be the first five steps. And that's just to get everyone else um, involved in the project rather yeah. than five people walking into a meeting and said, "Okay, what are we going to talk about?" Yes. Which, yeah, that's which I find a complete waste of time to have a meeting where someone doesn't have something that mm-hmm. they want to suggest and mm-hmm. have given some thought to it before they walked into the meeting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so that's how, but what I notice is I am so bought in to what you're um talking about here, Dean, that I've probably eliminated um, certainly in the last um, two or three years, I've just eliminated all projects where I'm spe- expected to go off and do something on my own because mm-hmm. I find it so non-productive and also frustrating. Mm-hmm. I find yeah, it takes such a, you have to clear such a big swath of, of time to allow for this little bit of time that you actually are able to wrangle I, I'll speak for me, that I have to create such a swath of space around me to create the chance that I'm going to be able to wrangle my attention for a fraction of that time to produce the mm-hmm. output that I need to produce. Because mm-hmm. that's what I mean about the reality of that. I think there's probably a five to one um, <laughs> you know, multiplier on the time that it takes if it's me doing it on my own. Okay, I want to add a thought to that, and I, it came out in a workshop last week, and it's uh, and I, maybe we talked about it on our last podcast. I don't, I don't quite remember, but it's um, when there's an event in the future that you really don't want to do. There is actually uh, you engage in what I would call dread time. Hmm. And dread time is that you're seeing yourself doing something you dislike yes. and uh, you dread it. And so five minutes could be wasted. An hour could be wasted in the, in the dread. And I, I've got a feeling that it's like a 10 to one with the dread time, with the actual, that could you know, be. the actual time, the event takes. Yes. And, uh, and uh, you know, I said it's kind of like when someone is condemned to be executed. The execution is usually quite quick. You know, it doesn't take yes. up a lot of time at all. Yeah, right. You know, yeah, it came. But the dread time for the individual who's thinking forward to this event, it could be in the hundreds or thousands of hours, depending on how long they sit in the cell before they're taken out and executed. 
You know, and right. I, I got to believe that that's the greatest punishment right there. The, 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 the actual execution, I mean, it's it's final, but it's not the it's not the most painful thing. It's the apprehension that's the most painful thing about it. Yes, I think and you're I, absolutely and, right, and that's and I think that where I have to deliver something on my own uh, is painful to me because. I really like utilizing other people's brains and I'm, yes. I, I don't, I don't have it when I'm there and I really need the feedback and other people introducing other dimensions that I'm not uh, myself going to actually create on my own. I, I actually need those other dimensions. Yes, I agree. I, I think that's really, and that's been an interesting um realization that what I really enjoy is I like to create contexts that will shape a, uh, you know, that kind of cordon off my thinking around a particular thing. Like I know that our, our conversations are really going to be focused on a, uh, on procrastination and productivity and in some this, form, in some yes, form, that's the mm-hmm. overriding thing. So I've got a, uh, container. And I often, you know, find myself moving these thoughts around in my head, knowing that we're going to be getting together so that I'm Mm -hmm. like this week, what's really been on my mind is observing my attention. And that, uh, so that was looking forward to having this conversation about it to really clarify what, what my thoughts are. Yeah. 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 And I feel, I feel, I feel exactly the same way. And as a matter of fact, um, um, a couple of times before our last several podcasts, I've actually said, Oh, I'm going to bring that up. You know, I thought, right. I said, Oh, that's a good one to bring up. And, yes. um, and, um, so we were, uh, I just finished off this last week. I had three workshops and these are the, final three for this particular quarter. And then Mm -hmm. starting in June, there'll be a workshop that's at least 50% different. So there'll be about four hours of new material when I come back for the first workshops in June. And, um, but the concept that really took off this past quarter was the one on bother being bothered. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think this fits in, um, with um, everything that we've been talking about here. As a matter of fact, I think I came up with the bother concept simply because you and I have for going on three years now been talking about the things that we procrastinate on. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing we procrastinate on uh, is something that really bothers us. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, and uh, so, but what I've come to because I've had 10 full workshop conversations on this is the bother itself is not very, very interesting. It's only that we are bothered. That's interesting. Yes. And how do you, how do you quickly get out of it? That's the only mm-hmm. thing that's really interesting to me because I, I have a total bias towards new action and new results. Yes. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, I think noticing those, um, you know, budding thoughts, that's mm-hmm. kind of what I mentioned when we, we you brought that up at our uh, workshop, you know, is that that's something that I have been uh, focused on for, for a long time, looking, being vigilant and looking for what start out as tolerations, um, you know, capturing them then of seeing, you know, that's, um, you know, the, I think the lowest form of, of bother. <laughs> before it kind of escalates to to being to getting hot and bothered kind of thing yeah uh, that I, I observed these things on uh you know and I, I used to have I used to consciously have a time on Mondays of make my life better day to uh you know look at and see what are the the top 10 things I'm I'm tolerating right now. Um, yes. And look to get rid of, um, 
those. It's a really interesting thing now to think about it with, you know, who can take, get rid of that for me. You who know? Can, yeah. Who's the how? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who does the how that I mm. don't like? That's exactly right. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting thing that I think that we're on something. Um, and I have no doubt that we can keep going with it forever. Um, uh -huh. you know, as long as you and I are in the mood to schedule a next hour, my feeling yeah. is that the topic that we're talking about, the context that we're talking about, um, is endless, that, uh, yes. we would always come up with new stuff. And the new stuff we come up with would make use of the growing amount of different other ideas that we've actually developed so far. So it's very, um, yes. uh, on the one hand, it evolves, but on the other hand, uh, there is a uh, multidimensionality about the discussion that um, we can make use of thoughts that were our main topic a year ago or two years ago, but now they just give more texture and they give more um um they give more density to any new thing that we come up with mm -hmm. i wonder how many episodes we're at right now with the joy of procrastination well my I we're... my i can tell you my podcast manager will be able to tell me that immediately because he's got the exact number of all the podcasts that i've done so oh, there we go i, I, will, have that. 62. I will have that number uh, i will I just, have that number for you 62 62 we're at yes that's a that's a lot of talking <laughs> and there is that's a lot of talking you're absolutely right but, yeah yeah a lot of great well, concepts it's, yeah There's and a book it's in there yeah well it's interesting yeah uh that might be a distraction actually <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not not for us to write, but there's some somebody yeah, can write never, a book in there. Yeah, well, yeah, I think that there are books. In other words, that there's, uh, and we, you know, I've already, you know, just with something you said one day, I've created a book, and I'm yes. going to create a bigger book, the Who Not How. As a matter of fact, it's completely transformed the entire strategic coach program from start to finish. I mean, one thought that you brought in. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's an interesting idea. Mind you, um, you know, the um, I had a lot of concepts that immediately wanted to meet with that new idea. Yes. Uh, when you when you brought it in. I mean, to a certain extent, um, you know, the um, unique ability concept of unique ability uh, teamwork needed who not how. Mm -hmm. or it go viral. I could explain it and everybody kind of got it. But when I said who not how about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people say, oh, who not how? Totally get it, you know? Yes. And the other thing is I've come to a um, uh, contrasting definition between delegation, which is a bit of a downer concept with most entrepreneurs. Yes. And, um, I remember we had this so I have conversation one of our Chicago. coaches. Yeah. And one of our coaches, Russell Schmidt, the, um, the longest reigning um, associate coach with strategic coach. In other words, someone coaching strategic coach other than me. And we now have 17 and he was the first and he's now in his 24th year. And he said, you know, forever we've been talking to the entrepreneurs who come to strategic coach about delegating. And they all nod their heads. Yes, very definitely got to delegate. And he said, but they came back to the next workshop and they did a little bit of delegation, but not as much as they could have. And he said, Hmm, I wonder why that is. When he then came to the workshop and he explained who, not how everybody immediately went out. And from a observer standpoint, they all went out and they delegated and they delegated quite extensively. So there's something about who, not how, that goes right to their brain center that yes. um, delegating then. So I was talking to three or four workshops about this, and then I finally got it that for the most part, delegation is a bureaucratic concept, mm -hmm. um, you know, and kind of in, in coach terms, 
you're taking an activity that you yourself hate and you're pushing it down to someone who's not as good as you and they will also hate it and probably in the process hate you. Yes. Okay. Who not That's how, true. on the other hand, is taking something that you don't like, aren't really good at, hate, dread, and you're pushing it up to someone who has a higher ability than you do, and they love it, and they like you more because you've done that. Yes. It's amazing. So it's just the it? totally opposite yeah. psychological, intellectual, psychological, emotional uh, concept. Yeah. These are these these are not synonyms they're antonyms you know mm-hmm. they're they're actually they're 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 the kind of the polar opposite the only thing is the only thing in common is that you hate the activity both for delegation and you hate the activity for who not how but yes. the result is um radically different from yes. almost any uh, any way you want to look at it yeah yeah, that's and that's interesting because it is so much in the language, right? Like delegation always does feel and imply that it's of someone of lower skill than you or lower that you are uh, above. You know, you're delegating down. Yeah, Even and the almost, way we look at it, uh, the language, right? Yeah, and it almost um, um, kind of is a bit of a defeat. You know, it's kind of a bit of a defeat because. Um, now you got to manage the person who you've delegated to, you know, in other words, you've just introduced, uh, another complexity issue into your life that goes all the way to the time horizon. In other words, now, now you got to keep track of what other person's doing. And if they don't like the activity, you have to man, you have to monitor them. You have to manage them and you have to motivate them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bummer. It is. <laughs> it is a bummer, you know. Yeah. Where... And you could see why this doesn't go anywhere, and why bureaucracies, after a while, just uh, you know lose. I, I believe that every bureaucracy, whether it's a corporate bureaucracy or a, a government bureaucracy, actually and starts off with some um, powerful motivation to actually get something done. Yes, you know, and, and but it quickly loses its internal energy because of the thing that you're here. You don't like doing something. You push it down to someone else who isn't as good as you are, or certainly isn't as powerful as you are. Right. And uh, uh, they don't really like the activity, but you know it's what they have to do. And there's just uh, more. You're, you've just expanded not liking doing something to another person. And it's almost like uh, uh, it's, it's the opposite of creativity. Mm-hmm. And it's, not, it's, the it's, absence. it's actually the absence of creativity. Yes. Yeah, because it really is the, I look at bureaucracy when we you think about it, that what's missing from it is self-interest or self, um, you know, self-direction that there's a lot of, um, you know, I think about Milton Friedman's ways of spending money. It's the same thing of spending time, right? You can, mm-hmm. as an asset, you know, when you're, I forget exactly how tell, you would, tell me that I'm not, I'm not sure I know that. Uh, okay. So he would say, and let me, I'll just, we'll work it out because I don't remember it exactly, but we'll work it out that he talked about the, the ways of spending money. So let's say we're tasked with buying a, a something for somebody that, that if we're spending our money on ourselves, we're going to get pay the most attention. We're going to make sure that we get the best value and get exactly what's the right thing for us. Right that that's how we get the highest level of attention there. If we're spending our money on someone else, we're mostly just looking for like, what's the bet, what's a suitable thing for somebody, right? Mm -hmm. That we're trying Mm -hmm. to get 
the best deal. We're not trying to go overboard or luxurious and we're trying to generally save money when we're spending our money on somebody else. Then when we're spending somebody else's money on somebody <laughs> else, <laughs> we don't really, <laughs> whatever it is, but when we're spending somebody else's money on us, then the best is the best is the, you know, we deserve the, the best of the, uh, the, the things. Right. And so I think it's that same, um, that same thing applies. It, it kind of, uh, get, gives you some, uh, criteria to look at whether universal basic income would be a successful program. I don't know. I, you know, that that's like a, but again, in the bureaucracy thing, when we're doing, when we're spending our time doing something that we really want and love to do, we're going to be fully invested with our attention and our intention in it. But when yeah. we're doing, we're spending our time doing something at somebody else's direction, we're going to do what is the the minimum uh, you know we're looking to do the least amount that we need to do to to comply yeah. you know in a bureaucracy when we're doing i mean it may be different if you're working directly with the entrepreneur and you feel like you're part of of making a contribution to something but if you are a you know, a rank and file numbered employee in a bureaucracy with three where the layers. person you and yeah, uh, where the person they don't actually own it, they didn't actually create it. Right, you're just doing. And I, in know. other words, like you're uh, you're a present day employee of one of the big automakers, like GM. Yeah. Well, it's a hundred year old company, and who, I, nobody even knows who created it because very few people really take the time to, uh, yes. you know, inquire in the history. But there's still, you know, there's still more than a dozen layers from the. Yeah, you know, and you're just doing safety. your work to to um, appease your supervisor. You know, that's yeah. really the and, thing and is you're doing. The then minimum. you have a union, a union steward who is acting on your behalf, so that right. you don't do too much work for your supervisor. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's really it. I'm, I'm actually reading a book right now. I'm uh, sorry to tell you, I don't have the title here. It's kind of an abstract title, and I'll bring it in on one of the uh, further ones. But it's a socialist in Europe in the 1990s. And um, I, I'm not finished the book yet, but he's trying to, um, within the framework of socialism, he's trying to uh, uh, figure out how um, capitalism can be socialized so that people in the 21st century have the same pride of activity and pride of ownership that single craftspeople had um, prior to industrialization, prior to mm. the uh, assembly line. And uh, I think he's going down a rabbit hole myself because um, um, he, you know, I, I find it interesting and I, I may not have shared this with you. I read a lot of books um, from the left, what's called the political left or the philosophical mm -hmm. left. Um, uh, first of all, because they are trying to grapple with with capitalism without being capitalists. In other words, uh, they're trying to come to grips with, mm -hmm. you know, this, um, you know, the the great inequality of capitalism. You know, automatically yeah. you put 10, 10 people in a capitalist system and you have ten ten different levels of uh, participation. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of capitalism that some people are going to be more gifted at it. This, I guess, yes. Pareto. Pareto's law. He said, yeah. you know, if you if you give everybody ten dollars uh, on day one and check in with them on day two, twenty percent of the people in the room have eighty percent of the dollars. Uh -huh. Okay, and it just seems to be natural that some people are more gifted at uh, focusing on pricing and profitability and and property, personal property, than other people are. It seems to be. Uh, 
a set of a set of uh, concepts. But I'm going through this because he's really grappling with something, and he's trying to grapple with what I would see as um, um, you know the unique ability, the whole concept of unique ability, and what we've tried to approach in strategic coach that if you're in your unique ability. In other words, uh, you identify things you love doing from those you don't, things that you're good at that from those that you don't. And work can be arranged so that you are increasingly just focused on what you're great at. Mm-hmm. And then you collaborate, you uh, do teamwork with people who are great at what they are. Everybody feels that it's an upward lift. And I think yes. he's trying to grapple that, but he doesn't have the concept of unique ability. And he doesn't have the concept of who, not how. You know, uh-huh. those are two missing, two missing things. And he doesn't really have the concept of uh, making your life bigger and better. And so he's missing completely the entrepreneurial factor when he's, he's um, you know, I mean, not once has he in the, you know, I'm halfway through the book right now. And not once has he talked about the whole notion that entrepreneurism is as different as you want to measure from bureaucratic life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's something, I mean, and I think that that, um, you know, I'm I'm wondering now about that as the way that we marshal our attention. If I bring mm-hmm. it, if I look at it, that that is a, an yeah. asset that we are, uh, uh, you know, able to direct or not. Do you, I'm wondering about, do you think... Um, how much of your attention on a, a daily basis do you think that you are directing um, intentionally? Well, I think there's quite a bit. And, yeah. um, you know, and I, I will say this is because um, the way my day is now structured is it's still I have the thing that I only um, set myself the goal of achieving three important things in the yes. day. And I, yeah. I've had that for at least 10 years. Yeah. And, uh, but then the second rule is I will not be doing this alone. Uh-huh. That's rule number two. Uh-huh. And number three is I'll be managed, um, either by, you know, um, you know, a game plan, which in uh-huh. my form would be an impact filter. Yeah. And I'll be I'll be managed by someone who's actually in charge of uh, the follow through from that activity. Yeah. Um, so the time is in the schedule. I, I show up, and and a lot of yours. Are you doing more? Are you doing more workshop days now or less? Well, I've uh, we've established a cap on it. So um, I hit twelve. I hit thirteen actually this year which you have to multiply by four because yeah. it's four workshop days. So it's 52, 52 days. Mm-hmm. And this year we've decided to put a cap on it and that um, I will not create any more uh, new workshop days, but there will be a factor of 10 times workshops after a while eroding, you know, with mm-hmm. renewals and they will be, um, you know, they'll be combined. Uh, eight days will be, um, combined into four days. So the two workshops will become one for the next year. And when that happens, I can start a new uh, game changer workshop. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. So, so over about a three year p- period, I'll be gradually diminishing the number of 10 times workshops I have and increasing the number of game changer workshops. I, I have just like yeah. you did and when then, you switched to 10 times. Like yeah, you were, except you I did that in one year. Everything. I did yeah. That. Yeah, I did that in one year, and um, but this this is a little bit more. Um, this is a little bit has a bit more things involved because I have to be, um, you know, it's it's just got more working parts to do it. Yeah. this next level than the one before, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. So so anyway, um, but the thing that I'm getting at here. Uh, if I do an overview of what I see you as having done, um, you know, in your entrepreneurial career and what I've done in my entrepreneurial career is that we've used, we've 
made better use of money that created larger amounts of money. And with that money, we bought talent to free us up from the activities that we don't like doing. Yes. And at the same time, we've um, gotten much more super focused um, that not only the activities we do love do, doing, but doing them in a way that we multiply the impact of the yeah. activities that we love doing, which gets you into the positive loop again, that it produces more money with which you can buy, um, you know, first class talent to take care of it. So my sense is that we're kind of in the entrepreneurial dream world. <laughs> I think that's true. I mean, it definitely feels like that, that, um, yeah, realizing it's taken a while to get to this point, but I definitely feel now that I've got a really great support environment that I can, you know, bring things in that really we are at a point where, um, and have been for some time now that I, I really, all I do are the things that only I can do. And that's been yeah. a, uh, that's been a great multiplier for us. Yeah. You know, one of our um one of our podcasts in the future I think should cover uh, dive deep into this point and, and that is that people say, Well, you'll probably get to the point, you know, where you've given everything away. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't I don't have any indication yet that that's gonna happen. You know, right. I mean if any, anything, the intensity of my focus has increased as the activities that only I can do have um, have become more powerful. Uh -huh. yeah, in and other words, the more impact I have doing the things that I love doing multiplies my desire to focus even more on them, devote you know, not more time, but better time. Yeah. And I imagine that part of the thing is that the, you never know what's going to happen. I think that might be true mm -hmm. if we're exhausting our own, like if we're off in a, in a, um, you know, tower somewhere, just kind of contemplating yeah. our own thoughts that Robinson Crusoe, you know, Robinson. yeah, that you're really going yeah. to reach the, the edge of your, uh, of your thinking. But I think that the unintended consequences or strategic byproducts of the things that are happening when we're doing it in a way that creates an environment for things like this, like our, our podcast is an environment that there's been strategic byproducts for both of us that, um, that multiply thoughts that you have. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not only that, but I depend upon it. Yes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's yeah, it the... Was really, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really funny. Uh, remember that uh, diagram I did of the United States in the last uh, Game Changer workshop? Yes, you know, I where do, I talked yeah. about the... The frontier. The free zone, the free zone frontier. Well, I've really, really, um, you know, it was so funny because... Um, I've taken some thoughts that Mark Young and I are doing from the American Checklist podcast, yes. uh -huh. and I, I moved them right into the Free Zone Frontier because the thesis of the Free Zone Frontier as it relates to the U.S. is that it was the actual 270 years from 1620 to 1890 where the population went for a mere hundreds uh, from the first settlements to, uh, I think in 1890, it was 63 million and pulling talented, ambitious, industrious, um, um, or just desperate people from Europe primarily and then other places. And that actually gave character to the United States that the character of uh, what we call the American character is actually not a function of the established colonies along the Atlantic, but it's actually the movement, of uh, the actual right. movement uh, of constantly uh, pushing the frontier out and creating free zones where money was really, really, uh, you know, money, uh, land was really free and there were yeah. new opportunities that didn't cost very much. And uh, I, I, was saying, I was saying, you know, that um, I, th I think it's unique in human history that you had a period of time like that 
and a particular country had that amount of un, you know, uh, uh, n- nobody had named the land. Nobody had put their right. name on it. I mean, mm-hmm. And they, they say, well, they took it away from the Indians, but the Indians didn't really have a sense of property. You know, they, 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 yes. they, they never established property rules or rights or everything else. And most of it was purchased anyway. It wasn't taken. They bought it from France or from Spain or from Russia. And, um, everything. But anyway, it's so funny, but that, that was like our, um, you know, joy of procrastination mindsets going into the program. But also there was a case where the American checklist went into the program, you know, so these podcasts Mm. are really uh, fantastic for me because I, uh, you know, I, I, I'll get an idea developing it in another framework, which is a podcast. Mm-hmm. And then that idea gets developed and it becomes useful for me in the main activity where, you know, the central money making activity for me. Yeah, I get it. And that's kind of, that's an interesting thing that I imagine you're setting. I think that that is a context that is set when you have a, a, a podcast that has a particular sort of um, zone or channel that you're keeping that. Like I imagine um, each of your podcasts has and serves a very different um, yeah. outlet and, for, and your, I, for your and thinking. And I have a dedicated, I have a dedicated partner, in, uh-huh. you know, a talking partner with each one of them. And, yes. uh, it, and it was one of the things, uh, this didn't actually come up, out of uh, my podcast with Peter Diamandis, but it was just being at Abundance 360. And I was hearing all these predictions, you know, of various technologies, 3D printing, um, virtual reality, driverless cars, um, you know, uh, renewable fuels and everything else. And there was something, it was just striking to me that, um, that, some of these ideas have been discussed five or six years in a row yeah. and predictions were made at, you know, on stage by uh-huh. the experts who are, you know, invested in these. And what yeah. I was noticing that the progress wasn't happening as fast as it was being predicted. Right. So it gave me an idea to go back. You know, I just went to Google and I said, uh, virtual reality. Um, what are the biggest obstacles for the progress of, virtual reality and they're written up you know i i could find 10 15 articles on it and i began to realize that in human affairs there's a certain amount of money that is um created just through the exciting prediction that something new is going to happen and then all sorts of people invest in it okay and there's a whole you know there's a whole industry of getting people excited about new ideas and taking money and just putting it, uh, you know, uh, in there. I, the new Theranos movie on Elizabeth Holmes is a good example. I saw that, by yeah. the way. Yeah. 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 She's kind of an eerie. Ca- yeah. I yes. know what happened. Uh, yeah. I think you, you said this, but we now know um, uh, where the children of the damned, what happened to the children of the <laughs> damned. Right. You know, That's because right. Because, she, because uh, one of them, anyway, we know uh, she was one of them. But uh, but when you look at how things actually over a time, a new technology actually gets roots and actually grows, it's all in working through the obstacles to the prediction. Yes. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's funny because that reminds me of Aubrey de Grey. I mean, that reminds me yeah. of the way that he's approaching um immortality that that's the thing of that they early on identified that there were five or seven key things that that you can't solve it unless you solve these seven things and if you solve these seven things you've essentially removed the uh you've made death optional yeah now well that's that's worth a look because I, I haven't seen those, so I'm, I'm, I'll certainly look those up. I, uh-huh. I, and um, but the interesting thing is, if you're okay, you know, I mean, and this is my strategy circle concept, and yes. all those things which seems to oppose our goals are actually the raw material for 
and the and the obstacles are not annoyances. The obstacles are reality. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and in uh, isolation, they're none. They don't seem as insurmountable. Yes, yeah. and um, you know, and um, so it kind of tells you. You know, I mean, I think that uh, um, uh, that the notion that we think the thought of something new and it's right there mm-hmm. actually isn't all that satisfying. Mm-hmm. I mean, we'll do it three or four times just for the novelty of it. But if there's yes. no effort on our part and we don't become better in any way by getting yeah. the result, then we get bored with the result. Yes. Yeah. That's, you know, and, and I wonder about, um, yeah, that just kind of makes me think about our, our balancing of input and output Mm -hmm. you know as far as attention like our i think by default our attention tends to focus on input that's effortless you know that Mm -hmm. doesn't require any uh it's it's just easier to engage your attention in something where you're just taking it in that's probably the easiest form of um you know, engaging our attention. And I know that you, you've got, you have a couple of hours that you're proactively taking in. Yes. In terms yeah. of seeking and just kind of looking and, but then, but you're not doing it in a way that is, um, you're doing it in a way you kind of go to the same things, but you don't know intentionally what you're, what you're looking for. You're allowing your attention to go where the story leads you. And it's funny how I, I noticed that too, that when I look at the certain sites, like I'll see certain um, headlines and I'll know that something will spark and go, that's an important one right there. That's a, that's yeah. something that's going to matter. And it, you know, to follow that, um, that down. Yeah, I think uh, it's very, very interesting. I, I had that, um, I actually had that experience a couple of times over the last couple of days. And, yeah. uh, I came, ac- I, uh, came across something and, uh, um, um, you know, and all of a sudden I said, oh, that that you know i used exactly your words that's really big and yeah. it was big because it allowed me to see in a new way a whole bunch of things i already knew but they hadn't clicked into a focus uh-huh. so the important new thing is important because it uh gives new meaning and new structure to things you already did know yes that's the importance, I think, of really having a frame, right? Having a framework that yeah. we're kind of looking for. Like you look at, you know, we're kind of look. There's some overriding themes that kind of set the context for all the things we're interested in: mm-hmm. being yeah. entrepreneurs, productivity, longevity, uh, all of these things that. Um, kind of get on our radar because as much as it is, I don't really, um, yeah, I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not drawn or bringing attention to new developments in textiles or manufactured goods or anything like that. That's not where our frame is. We're not in, you know, manufacturing or, or in any, uh, sort of frame like that where we're interested in entrepreneurship and yeah. uh, you know future oriented stuff mm-hmm. and I think that's an important thing then I just wonder about like this the reason I've been thinking about the attention um you know is this is trying to find this balance of get of directing the attention versus letting the attention get hijacked or, or seduced. 
and Do you I think find yourself the reason, experience like that? Yeah, yeah. I think that the the reason, um, and um, and I noticed the antidote, um, the antidote to getting uh, overwhelmed by input for me is to come up with a really, really good question, a uh-huh. really good question. And then um, it's that the input has reminded me to ask a question, but the the question uh, isn't logically the, uh, you know, the result of the input. In other words, I just went a bunch across a whole bunch of input and then I a question came into my mind, but it's not actually that you couldn't have designed this input. You know, if you put this input, this input, this yeah. input together, uh, then you'll have this question. And it wasn't like that. It was just that because my mind was engaging with a whole a bunch of things that came up. So, you know, for example, um, uh, I'm very interested in politics and yeah. um, uh, the um, first, so, you know, um, the Democrats, um, because they lost the last election in the states, uh, hate the Electoral College because um, Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote, but she lost the Electoral College. And they said, you know, it's about time that we put an end to this and make the whole thing, um, you know, the popular vote. Well, it's the eighth time that it's actually happened. She's not the first. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, where the uh, loser actually got more popular vote than the, the winner. And so I said, well, they think that it's kind of like a vote of Congress or something. that they can come in or the president just say, well, we're going to get rid of the Electoral College. So I spent about, uh, you know, I spent about a half hour deep, uh, diving dig, uh, deep into the whole issue. Uh, how how would you get rid of the Electoral College? And it's yeah, it's by its it's self defeating by the very attempt. And I think that the founding founding uh, you know fathers, especially Hamilton and Madison, and that group. So you have to get two thirds of the Senate to vote on it. So. You have to get two thirds of the senators, 67, to say we want to get over it. Then you have to get the Congress, and so two thirds of 435, and then you have to get three quarters of the state legislatures. And all told, it takes about 10 years to do that. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and uh, and all of a sudden, I said, "Gee, boy, I mean, so many you know newsmen and you know politicians are talking about." getting rid of something when they don't even know how you would go about doing that. And, uh, uh, it, it couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. You know? Right. And the, re- and the reason is it favors the smaller states and the, the number of senators and Congress people, if you take all the smaller states together and then you take the legislators, of the smaller states, uh, they, they, they they are protected by the electoral college so that they you could never get the votes you could never get two thirds of the senate two thirds of the you know the congress house of representatives and three quarters so the, the thing that really fascinated me is I don't know why I was thinking that question but all of a sudden I just had a very concentrated forty minutes I'm I'm not necessarily talking about the content of the topic here but what my mind did because it was wandering around. And then a question came into my mind. I said, what is the actual process we're doing? Now? Is that easy? Is it hard? Is it impossible? And that to me is like I just got rewarded with a master class on something really interesting. Yeah. And that, it doesn't matter that, what it is. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. I just gave this as an example, but mm-hmm. I said, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing is your mind can go wandering but then a question comes in, and then the que- questions, by their very nature, really focus your attention. That is true. Do you constrain your that time? Like, do you set a um, like a particular like this no, is my no, this is my a, window? I a, no, I wouldn't set a limit on it. It was until no. I got to the bottom of it, you know, and uh-huh. you know, this is Google and Wikipedia and whatever, you know, other source that I have to go to. Right. But uh, what a great thing. And I mean, just what what a great thing. And what a great thing to have in mind. 
It really is. That's what's so fascinating is there's never ending, never ending things that we can, uh, that we can do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it, uh, it kind of tells you, you want to protect it, you know, have it yes. in fighting shape, you know, have yes. it top, top notch shape because it, uh, it can do so such amazing things. I find that just uh, amazing what it can do. Yeah. And, uh, well, we've really traveled a straight road today, Dean. We really did. It doesn't seem like it could be possible that it's been an hour already, but it has. Yeah. Yeah. What I mean, straight road, you know, we were really constrained yeah. in what we <laughs> 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 don't look off to the side, pay no attention to anything. <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, that's so funny. Anyway, well, one of these days pleasure. we're going to run out of things to talk about. Yep. Um, I think it's a couple of weeks now. I think it's two yeah. weeks before we talk again, because I'm off to do stem cell therapy on Thursday. Hey, look and- at you. In Utah, and then I am going to Genius Network. So, Have you talked to uh, Dave Asprey since he did his full body yeah, makeover? Yeah, yeah, is, I have. he's fully on board here, huh? Yeah. Well, I talked That's to awesome. somebody um, who was a first year entrepreneur in the Ten Times program. He's a doctor, and he went through it about six six months ago. And he said, uh, it surprises you what it does. And he said, the thing that surprised really? me the most was how fast my reaction time has gotten again. He said, I remember oh, being an athlete when I was a teenager. And he said, I remember what good reaction time I had and I didn't have it, but I've gotten it back in the last six months. So that, uh, Love it. I find that interesting. Well, I can't wait to hear all about it. Yeah. I said, can you, can you snatch flies out of the air? And he says, oh, not there yet. <laughs> I'm not quite there. That seems to me the gold standard. That would be the gold standard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get there. Okay. I love it. Thanks, Dan. I'll talk to you soon. Great talk. Bye. Bye.